This is the um, this is the kit of the samurai in the during the probably the Edo period. This is probably what you would see, uh, not um, with samurai who are with their daimyos or their masters, uh, but maybe those who have lost their master and now what are called ronin, um, or those who have sort of lost their honor and now are traveling. And um, so there are, of course, uh, many, many, many iconogra iconographic uh, his, his, um, histories, uh, historical pictures of samurai. However, many times it's focused around their primary weapon, the katana. Um, and so most scholarship or popular interest in samurai is based on their weaponry. But there are a few pictures um, where the samurai actually have a bag on. And in terms of bushcraft or survival and the history of looking at uh, what accoutrements were valuable to people uh, across civilization and across time, uh, I'm interested and not only the weaponry of the samurai, um, uh, having studied various martial arts, including the art of the samurai sword or iaido, I have a great interest in various weapons and the forging techniques. But I'm also interested in what did the samurai carry uh, if he was traveling over distance and had to take care of core body temperature control. He had to thermoregulate. He had to stay out of inclement, inclement weather. He had, weather. He had to make shelters, temporary shelters, if needs be in an emergency scenario. He needed to be able to use um, some type of combustion element to effect fire uh, to protect his uh, thermo, to th thermoregulate and to prevent from him uh, becoming hypothermic. So the, so the samurai as well um, as any other soldier across time, or any warrior, or any person in the wild, would have to preoccupy themselves with those things, at least have those things upon, on them. And so this got me uh, fascinated. I've done a series on the five C's on the ancient monk. But I'm also, I was also drawn to, hey, would, is there any historical evidence for the samurai in terms of what they would carry on their person um, as they would move over distance uh, in the ancient world. And uh, is, are the five C's again applicable to 15th and 16th century uh, Japan where the feudal lord periods are and where there are warring competing tribes and daimyos and masters and, 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 and fiefdoms uh, and there are these mercenaries, the ronin, there are these samurais, there are these um, warriors who may have to travel over distance of time. So I, so I was doing the research and found some very fascinating things. Um, when we look at the, so when we look at the, when we look at the basic kit of the samurai, of course, 
everybody knows the katana. This is the long sword of the samurai. Um, and this is the um, primary weapon of the samurai. So not only for per personal defense, uh, but it is uh, their cutting tool. Carried alongside with the, with the katana was almost always a smaller blade. Here I have a tanto style blade. Uh, it could be a wakazashi style blade, which is more of a medium size uh, sword, which was used for indoor fighting. But also, a tanto was an option that many samurai would carry. And this is a tanto uh, blade, and it is a smaller blade. As you can see, it is a smaller blade. As you can see, and although this is not a hand forged um, blade, it is reminiscent of what a tanto may look like in that Edo, in the Edo period. Um, and so, the samurai would uh, keep his primary weapons on his person in this in this fashion, in his belt system, and he would be able to deploy them at a moment's notice. Notice that the samurai sword is deploy is, is uh, put onto the belt, secured onto the belt, with the blade edge facing up, and this is because um, they would use the technique where instead of having to draw first and then cut, they could immediate from the blade edge up, come and cut. It could be used to cut immediately from the blade edge up. Um, so we have this main accoutrement, of course, the katana blade. Um, we also have the the uh, straw hat or the bamboo hat, the the reed hat, uh, which was very traditional. Uh, in fact, monks wear this to this day, but we know that samurai use these things for shade protection like here, like as I'm doing now, which is it's fantastic, creating a, an awesome amount of coolness around my neck and head area, um, and allowing the wind just to flow right under and cool everything down, and uh, really taking advantage of that convective breeze. And of course, they would also have some other accoutrements on there. Let's get in a little closer, and let me lay this out and show you what some of those accoutrements would be. In most um, samurai histories um, and texts, most of it is about the fighting arts and different types of martial arts included and incorporated within the, the study of the samurai, a sword, etc. Um, however, it, ha it was very, very hard um, to, to find texts and historical um, evidence for what the samurai actually would carry. 
And so, um, doing some research and digging in um, to the history, uh, uh, I, I uh, found on the find on the web uh, some individuals asking about certain items that were being sold in Japan. And these items were good luck charms and good luck items. Those items were actually a type of flint and steel, probably uh, uh, agate um, and or quartz because flint is not readily available in Japan um, or parts the, the certain parts of Japan. So um, in those stones, in those boxes that, were, that they were selling as charms, uh, there was a flint and steel, and those sparks would be used uh, apparently for good luck. And so people, um, one scholar looked into that um, and, and sort of uh, dug into the history behind that. Why are these things being used uh, as good luck charms? And there's many sort of um, uh, uh, stories about it. But essentially, um, the flint and steel or the hard rock and steel combination um, that we see in butchcraft, but also that existed uh, many from many centuries before, um, all the way probably from the Iron Age, uh, 1200 BC, is where we can probably uh, assume those types of technologies were available to people, because we see it also present in historical documents of ancient Buddhist monks carrying that, and I did another video on that, uh, check that out. But um, the Hiuchi Ishi, the Ishi, or the Stone of Fire, um, uh, was a type of implement, or flint steel was a type that was carried by people, uh, certainly in the Edo period. The Edo period, fire making was uh, absolutely essential part of life. There were no uh, electric grids and electric propane gas burners, etc. And so all the cooking and normal day utilization of fire would have to be utilized. And so they needed, and of course, matchbox or matches were not, uh, intro were not create, uh, invented until we see, I believe, the 18th and 19th centuries, right? Um, so prior to that, we're talking about flint and steel technology. And uh, during the Edo period, where the summer were at its height, and um, um, we see that most likely they were using the flint and steel option. Um, uh, we see that um, there was a ceremony called a kiribi, uh, where which one would send uh, someone off on a journey, uh, send them off by striking a stone with steel and spark so that the sparks would fall on their back and sort of bring them a light upon them, good luck and um, light. Um, there are other uh, ceremonial uh, ceremonies being associated with fire and the life and warmth and the light that it brings in darkness um, uh, that you see uh, in also Buddhist shrines and Buddhist rituals, also Shinto shrines in, in Asia, particularly in Japan. So we know that that technology was available to them and it is most likely that in the satchels that we see in the iconography of um, uh, Musashi, uh, fighting other samurai, um, uh, and having a satchel, it's most likely that in his satchel he contained uh, or he had uh, flint and steel items just like this. Um, some type of charred material, could be a charred cloth, it could be a charred uh, organic material, um, and also would have ready-made tinder bundles. Um, and of course we know that cordage was available to them because even on the swords we see all sorts of cordage um, that were attached to the swords for, for grip and um, uh, comfort of, of use to produce that friction within the hands as, they're, uh, as they were uh, wielding their swords. Um, also, we see cordage as well uh, in organic styles um, with different types of braids. This is just simply jute twine to give a flavor of what they may have carried, but they may have carried hanks of cordage uh, like this in their, in their kits um, alongside with their combustor. So here, again, um, we see that the... Uh, um, the samurai would contain most of the five C's available to them. The cutting tools uh, were very, very, very um, sharp. This is uh, actually a real, real um, sword. Um, and it is, uh, it is at a zero grind, convex grind. I don't know if you can see that, but it's a 
there is a zero degree grind on that, so the, the edge goes right down to the blade. The blade goes right down to the edge with no secondary bevel. There's a convex grind that is consistent with the historical um, samurai sword. And so we would have those cutting tools available to them. Um, these cutting tools like the tanto, which of course were used for short distance fighting and or self-defense and or the, uh, you know, uh, seppuku or the, um, the harikiri, the, um, you know, uh, the honor of the samurai where he would commit suicide um, if he was dishonored. Um, this was the blade that he would do it with. But it could also be used in a pinch in a situation where he had to, where he had to, it could be used um, to to create feather sticks or, or, or to process some types of wood with. It's robust enough and the tang falls down, uh, probably down to three-fourths, uh, two-thirds or two-thirds or three-fourths of the way down the, um, the uh, handle. Um, I, don't, I don't believe they would probably baton with this, but in a pinch, if they had to, uh, to aid in fire starting, uh, this tools could certainly be used uh, without creating too much damage to the, brim, to the, to the blade provided that it was a uh, simple tasks in processing wood and such things like that. So those things were available, those things, uh, those capabilities were uh, definitely available to them. So they had the cutting tools, they had the cordage, they had the um, uh, 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 different types of cordage, hanks of cordage, organic cordage, and they most, most likely probably carried the hiuchi ishi, um, uh, which was the available way of starting fires at that time. They would also probably carry a bowl, uh, which would be uh, their rice bowl or their wine bowl, uh, or you know, um, and also you know perhaps they would carry some chopsticks or something like that uh, to help them you know uh, when or and probably uh, okay, there are some records um, from the Edo period uh, in recruitment papers where the general rations for uh, military were rice and beans, so they would be, probably be carrying also a type of rice and beans in there. Uh, to be able to uh, eat along the uh, along the wharf uh, along the um, trail if they are traveling or during um, during a battle or you know when they're a little bit of a cease of a also battle. Also in a work uh, titled Samurai Heraldry um, by Turnbill Stephen Turnbill I believe his name is um, there is mention of a discussion of the analysis on flags that they would use military flags or what they would call uh, standards. Uh, during warfare, and some samurai would hold these flags. They would be sort of the flag bearers as they would fight, um, as the teams of samurai would fight fight uh, the the opposing team, the opposing um, armies. And there is um, one reference um, in a battle where, in which the troops uh, along a, uh, a a narrow mountain path in Inabayama. Um, 1564 signaled Oda, Oda um, Nobunaga's troops uh, below by waving their water gourds from the end of their spears. So I had a very, very hard time uh, researching so many different types of pictures and iconography and different types of material on samurai, and everything was about techniques or, or fighting stances or fighting materials or, you know, the Book of Five Rings by Musashi and uh, how to defeat your opponent, your mental state, the meditative state, uh, the, the mind of no mind, you know, all these kind of things, philosophical things, but there was no, I was curious on what is in their satchels because I'm interested, I was interested in whether or not the five C's were applying to the samurai and I could not find any reference to any containers, even in, in the cave that Musashi stayed at at the end of his life, uh, one of the most famous, if you don't know who Musashi is, he is one of the, fa the most uh, legendary samurai in um, the history of, of the samurai. And at the end, he was a he was a real killer, and he was able to you know slay his opponents. Opponents, uh, he would use psychological techniques on them to defeat them, like arriving late and dishonoring them, and making them angry, and, and you know doing all these unorthodox techniques. Fighting with two swords was his was his technique, and um, so he would do many unorthodox psychological techniques as well to defeat his opponent. Um, and I, there was so much about him, so much literature about him, but nothing about what he would carry. So I had to literally go in and investigate, sort of piecing uh, things together, kind of looking at different uh, texts, also exploring what, uh, during the Edo period, the, um, the, uh, the military 
officers would be carrying because th those people would also be samurai or certain ranks trained by samurai and so that would give me a clue and so I could not find a, a place where um, I could find a container so I could obviously we know that they would have a sword obviously we know uh, there is now I, I researched that there was reference to the um, hiu, the Hiuchi uh, Ishi uh, stones that were being that were used in normal Edo period life, and that's where I got the inference that probably most likely that this that the uh, warriors or samurai that are traveling over distance would use such a fire uh, starting device. Not that there are any historical texts that are saying that samurai themselves would carry them, but by inference, since that technology was available and readily available to Edo period peoples, uh, it is highly likely that the samurai would also carry them uh, just in case they would need them along a a traveling road or along uh, a, a distance where they would travel um, that they themselves as also as people would also be uh, uh, very concerned about thermoregulating and if there was a situation where in which their core body temperature dropped too low that they were they would be able to regulate themselves by the use of creating fire <clears throat> and so um, we know that technology was available that we know cordage was available so we have cutting tools, we have cordage, we have combustion device, we have covering, we know um, that we know that they would carry their satchels in some type of cotton cloth or some type of wool cloth was available to them as well. Um, uh, we know that when it rained they would wear um, sort of thatched thatch straw or a grass grass mats that they would put on to drive the rain off them sort of like grass shingles. Um, so we know those kind of covering elements existed. So we know that there were cutting tools. We've discovered that Edo period people use uh, combustion devices like flint and steel. Uh, we know that there was cordage because on the swords we have cordage and, and in organic uh, different types of uh, uh, cordage. Um, also we know that they had um, covering devices as well. So we have cutting tools, we had combustion, we had covering and we had cordage. But of course the gourds, I mean the, the, the containers were the hard thing to, to find. And uh, in that battle where Nobunaga's troops signal, uh, where they signal um, uh, to Nogunaga tro Nobunaga, Nob uh, Nobunaga's troops, um, a detached, you know, his team is signaling with gourds. That was the sort of uh, final confirmation that uh, of what type of water container they would carry to carry water over distance. Obviously, they can't um, disinfect water uh, with this with this particular gourd. Um, or this style of gourd, uh, but they would be able to carry water over distance and that would be their container. Um, so again, we see that the five C's uh, uh, were available to the samurai. They had the cutting tool, they had the combustion device, they had the container, they had the cordage, and they had the covering, like this kind of wool blanket uh, that could be used for uh, uh, when they would bed down at night. It's interesting, in the Shimazu preparations for the Korean invasion, in 1591, there is mention of um, uh, of what they are, uh, how many men that they will be uh, mobilizing, and they have a grand total of 12,433 men, and they say that the provision for these men for five months will be uh, 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 um, different types of things, um, um, including 616 koku of beans being for five months at the rate of two sho per day. Uh, for each horse and rice and beans together will be 11,438.9 koku or units of rice. Um, there would also be mounted knights, uh, there would be uh, 69 mounted knights, 2,000, uh, you know, a total of 15,000 uh, plus men. And so there are these uh, recruitment, there are these recruitment uh, papers that are in existence that provide us with some window of, of um, a sort of clues or intimations on what the samurai would actually carry. So included in their kit is most likely some type of food that would be able to sustain them. Okay. In the Shimazu uh, recruitment order in 1576, uh, this is where they're drafting uh, men for, the, uh, for military service and for expeditions. And they say that the men should uh, uh, bring implements to be carried, um, you know, different implements. Uh, what I found was interesting was like bring hoes, bring broad axes, bring sickles, bring saws, bring chisels, bring adz, you know, uh, metal adz, um, bring dirt carriers, bring coils of rope, 
uh, and they are telling these men to, to bring these things when they are, after they're drafted, they, they enter into the military, bring those things, and they will be used as supplements to the things that the military will provide you. And this is in uh, ancient um, Japan in the, you know, uh, 1500s. So we know that they're talking about coils of rope, again, cordage. We know that they have uh, saws, and also they have axes. They're saying to bring broad axes as well. So those cutting tools are available to them as well. In a um, fascinating battle, um, or a legendary battle, which is a mythological battle between uh, Miyamoto Musashi, Musashi uh, the legendary samurai warrior, and Tsukahara Bokuden, uh, who was also a master, um, and he was, he actually ended up uh, well, in this mythological battle, uh, even though he had died prior to Musashi's existence, um, <clears throat> uh, later stories would be constru constructed over time, uh, you know, through legendary mythological tales about them fighting and these masters meeting each other. And Bokuden uh, was supposedly fighting Musashi with these uh, uh, little, uh, you know, um, uh, pot coverers. So there were, you know, iron pots that were covered with sort of a, uh, a, a, a wooden circle. And that was, of course, another hint to me that they would also have containers as well. Containers, uh, we know that there's ancient ironware um, that the Japanese would use, uh, like ancient iron teapots and iron bowls. Um, even for tea ceremony, uh, there are iron furos and fire parts places where you would put your iron pots and perform different types of tea ceremony. So we know that there's iron pots. Now whether or not those iron pots are actually carried over distance or in different kits, maybe in smaller sizes, highly possible. But that would provide the samurai with some way of boiling and disinfecting uh, uh, questionable water uh, um, that, are, that, are, that, are, that may be filled with, uh, you know, such um, protozoa like um, Cryptosporidium or, or Giardia, etc. <clears throat> What is interesting is um, when I was researching the sparks of the uh, sort of the, the the combustion methods of the samurai, and um, before I had I had found uh, those documents uh, talking about the Edo period and how a normal Edo period would use the Hiuchi uh, Ishi, I had stumbled upon um, one of the uh, philosophical methods, so to speak, or or explanations of a strike. Um, or a, 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 a philosophical a method of sword fighting that Musashi would uh, talk about. And that's when he was talking about uh, in, his, um, in his Book of Five Rings, which is the real famous, um, famous uh, work that he wrote in his final days in the cave when he had retired from fighting. Um, he had one, one uh, uh, um, situation um, where he would describe it as blow like a spark from a stone and um, it read uh, it read like um, uh, if you are currently within a situation in which you and your opponent's swords are to clash you must strike extremely hard without raising your sword to any extent this is the blow like a spark from a stone technique if you are to perform this technique you must first strike quickly with the three combined forces of your legs hands and body the blow will be rather difficult to perform if you do not train in frequent times. If you diligently train yourself, you'll be able to increase the overall force of the technique's impact. And he related this to uh, striking, uh, you know, uh, steel uh, on on um, on uh, on some type of flint. He related it to that type of striking. Um, uh, 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 but, but of course, in the context of actual sword fighting, um, where the where the swords would about be about to clash, and he was saying basically simply that you would strike it with force, as you would strike a flint flint um, with a with a piece of steel, and the the technique is actually called blow like a spark from a stone. So I thought that was quite interesting in researching these various elements and actually discovering that, yes, the samurai as well, the samurai as well. So we're talking about now in a, in a, in a, in a, in a uh, uh, land that is away from uh, India or different types of, uh, or, or the mainland of China or these kind of things, uh, we are talking about all the five seas again being consistent and being present in the age of the samurai, uh, and not only that his legendary uh, swords uh, he had on his person, but most likely if he was traveling over distance, that he would also have these legendary items as well. Um, 
You would have the cutting tools, you would have the cordage, you would have the, cut let's do that on, on my hand so we can see it. You would have the cutting tools, you would have the combustion devices, you would have the containers, you would have the cordage, and he would have the covering. And these things would all fit on his person quite uh, happily, <clears throat> and he would be able to do many, many things with these types of items, um, uh, not in, in securing temporary and uh, immediate shelters, emergency shelters, uh, creating fire and controlling his core body temperature, securing water and uh, possibly disinfecting water, maybe using the gourd in, a, in the bowl in terms of uh, rock boiling water, uh, that would be possible. Um, and of course, not only those things, uh, he would probably have a little bit of food to be on his person, and of course security, he would have his major weapons, he may even have a spear, or he may even have a bow and arrow on him uh, as well, um, which would provide him with security against not only predators, but the most dangerous ones at that time, or who, who were his opponents and the two-legged uh, predators uh, that he was fighting, or running from, or uh, avoiding, or uh, 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 had a possibility of encountering during a transition period to another place. So again, we see that the five C's do do appear again um, in the uh, the mythical uh, figures um, of the samurai who were real people, real men um, that would carry real items and they had to deal with real issues. The same that any bushcrafter today would have to deal with core body temperature control, uh, constructing emergency shelters, fire, water, uh, food, security, all those kind of things. Um, those samurai would also have to encounter them, and he did. And we see that in his case, it is most likely that he did have all these five C's available to them uh, as we look into the uh, various historical references uh, uh, and, and analyze that period. So the, uh, the question was that if the five C's of survivability were indeed um, consistent over time and civilization, um, and if it was truly the uh, most hardest to uh, reproduce uh, accoutrements and items, uh, but that would most uh, help affect survivability and or sustainability within a uh, wilderness scenario, then of course we should be able to see that the five C's should be present um, in the items and the accoutrements that would be carried uh, even amongst the uh, medieval samurai as well. Um, and of course, what we have discovered uh, through this um, study is that indeed they are, the five C's again are, that systemic typology again is present uh, within the ancient warrior, the samurai as well. Uh, particularly, most likely, uh, not necessarily the samurai who would be fighting in battle and then returning back to a certain campground, but in particular the ronin, the ronin or the wandering samurai, the wave men, the people of the wave, you know, wave men meaning sort of they're flowing uh, from place to place and uh, ebbing and flowing and, you know, disappearing and, and appearing and disappearing. Uh, most likely the traveling or wandering samurai or ronin uh, because they had to carry some type of accoutrements in their satchels uh, as they travel over distance, uh, perhaps going to a different um, region uh, where they would be hired uh, for a different type of work. Um, some of them would become, would do uh, ninja assassin type work uh, because they would have all those martial skills. Um, some of them would end up um, fighting for different, um, uh, you know, parties or daimyos or lords. Um, uh, they would be recruited in. Um, some of them would actually end up becoming gang members and, and becoming, uh, uh, entering into gangs to uh, pursue, uh, uh, you know, money and power, etc. Um, but, uh, in with regards to what they would be carrying, uh, we know of course they would always be carrying their samurai uh, swords or katanas, wakazashi or tantos. Um, that's always a given, um, uh, as well as maybe other different types of hidden uh, weaponry. But at the same time, we can also discover that they also, in their satchel, hidden away, and probably not too dramatic for the normal. Um, uh, a person who are interested in samurai, but for those who are interested in bushcraft survival, it is of course another, it's very historically relevant, that even those traveling warriors and samurai, mythological samurai, would be carrying um, the five C's that we use in the modern day today. I found it to be very interesting, and it was a great um, excursion uh, into uh, researching uh, some of, uh, one of the figures that I have always enjoyed uh, from a very young age, um, the samurai, 
And of course, as we delved into it, we did discover that the five C's uh, are uh, present in the uh, kit or in the gear list of the ancient samurai. I hope you enjoyed this uh, study and this video. Uh, I certainly did researching it, although it was a lot of research and many, 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 uh, maybe over a couple hundred pages of, of dis, you know, studying and researching. Uh, but I did find it, uh, find it uh, exciting and invigorating, interesting to get little clues and pieces uh, that eventually led to uh, very interesting discoveries uh, that, that again confirmed that the five C's uh, were uh, employed uh, at this, uh, in, in the arms and in the hands uh, of skilled, skilled uh, ancient samurai. I uh, hope you enjoy the video. Uh, this is Sean, uh, Sean Moon from uh, Save Monk Outdoors. And uh, uh, please like, share, and subscribe. And as always, God bless, get outdoors, and get blessed. Take care, guys. Thank you.